Hello, everyone, and welcome this morning. You are in for a treat today, the 152nd annual meeting of Ex Officio Trustees, and we have gone virtual today for this year. This session that you are in right now is called Career Connections, Transition Conversations from the Classroom to the Job Site, and we are thrilled that you chose this session to be with us today. While you are coming in, what we wanna do is just launch a poll. We would love to be able to know who is with us in this session as you're coming in. You can access the poll. I'm gonna read the questions out and if for any reason you might be unable to uh, answer and access the poll, feel free to put any information into the chat because we are monitoring that. The first question is, what is your job title? We would love to know if you're an EOT, EOT assistant, an educator, uh, maybe you're with a college, university, state administration. If you're in the other category, feel free, drop it in the chat box. We would love to know where you, uh, what your job title is. And also, we are eager to know where you're from. With going virtual this year, we have reached so many places unlike ever before. So we would love to know what part of the United States you're from. Um, we would love to know if we have reached Alaska and Hawaii, and it looks like we have one. Um, we love also that the U.S. territory, uh, Canada might join us today, places from other um, European countries as well. We would just like to know who it is that we get to serve today in our conversation. And I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and I'm going to share out results with you so that you can see that it seems like for our job title we have um, what has won out, if you will, our other category. So, so interesting to know what didn't make it into our drop down list, but we do have EOTs, vision rehabilitation specialists. Love that we have teachers of the visually impaired, orientation and mobility specialists. We also have state administration. Welcome to everyone. And I saw in the chat box as it went by that we have reached Hawaii. And Lisa, I know that you are up incredibly early or maybe it's in the middle of the night where you are. We are glad Lisa that you're here with us as an EOT. And um, so we have the Southeast part of the United States has one out as uh, in our room right now, we have 20 people from there. So glad to know where everybody is from. During this session, you have access to the chat box. Please know that when putting information in the chat box, be sure to go to the bottom and check the little carrot and check on so that it says all panelists and attendees. That just allows conversation from different people uh, to be able to see in the audience. If, you, if it is selected to just panelists, only us presenters on um, the, the connection end on this end will see it and all the friends and family and colleagues on your end won't. We want people to be able to make those connections. And I'm going to also put into the chat box really quick our opening code. And the opening code for today is future. There are some specific instructions on how to access our link for submitting all of that good information. It's in the chat box. It's also in your crowd compass. That is, uh, the Crowd Compass is your compass throughout this annual meeting. It's going to give you links to everything as well as your certificate of attendance. So be sure to meet that. We're glad you're here. Make yourselves comfortable. And I am happy to uh, pass things over to you, Aliyah. Uh, I need to unmute. I know <laughs> that's always. <laughs> I started talking. I was like, "Oh, I think uh, I, I think I need to unmute myself." So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Olaya Landa Villard, and uh, I'm the director of the APH. Uh, Connect Center, which uh, part of the Connect Center includes Career Connect, and I am going to throw this over to Richard because he is our Career Connect expert. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Uh, thank you, Alaya, and good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome from Hawaii to the East Coast. Boy, we, we hope not to disappoint today 
And I'm really thrilled to be a part of the Career Connect Center staff and help really uh, propel some good discussions today. We've got a jam-packed program, so we're gonna really get started really quick. I do wanna say that we have a lot of initiatives that we're working on, and you're gonna hear more about that tomorrow, but I'm pleased to be joining Alaya and the team to really make Career Connect a go-to place. APHCareerConnect.org is a place to go for blogs, for employment uh, situations, for interviews, for informational interviews, for mentoring, things, uh, the legacy things that you've come to know, APH, uh, Career Connect from years ago are, are very similar today and we'll be doing even more things with Career Connect. So as you listen and participate in this webinar, go to aphcareerconnect.org and uh, check it out and give us feedback. We're always looking for how we can make it better and really uh, engage with you, your students, and your, your job seekers of all ages, because that's, that's, we want that to be the place to go as you participate and engage and, and look for online resources, especially in, in the day of pandemic. Uh, we're looking for as many resources as possible. Uh, to that end, we're also uh, created a national transition listserv, and that information can also be found up on aphcareerconnect.org. Uh, I myself have been working in the field of transition for over 20 years. Uh, I was first a rehabilitation counselor here in California working in blindfield services and I did a lot of outreach up and down the state. We even created a summer work experience through our BEP program about 15 years ago where students got to work in the field and learn how to stock shelves and interact with the community. And uh, since then, I've, I've worked at several nonprofits, uh, also with Lighthouse for the Blind, Junior Blind of America, and Society for the Blind. So I bring my expertise to uh, Connect and, and want to really uh, welcome everybody and uh, give us as much feedback. We will be sending out a pulse survey later on uh, this, this week, and please look out for that. And I will uh, definitely put my contact information in the chat box, as I think most of us will. I think I've covered all the highlights. Uh, we've got a jam-packed program today. I do want to introduce uh, Aliyah again, who will introduce our first speaker. But basically, this morning, we're going to be covering uh, the work, um, WIOA, Work Innovation and Opportunity Act. We're going to hear from uh, experts on that and what, what to expect down the line. And we're going to hear from Kathleen and Rob, who are going to talk to us about work experience and, and all the research and data re beyond that. And, and their own experiences working with youth. And then we're going to end the day with Ann Kwong, who's going to talk about culture and diversity. And uh, I see that Rob has joined. So great. We've got, we've got speakers for each session lined up. Alaya, uh, back to you. Okay, I made sure to unmute myself this time. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Robert. Well, I'll give you really quickly uh, just a little bit of my background um, as a director of the Connect Center. Um, my background is as a, a teacher of the visually impaired, as a, an educational diagnostician for students who are blind or visually impaired, multiply disabled and deaf blind. Um, I'm also bilingual, so I, can, I specialize in, um, in working with students who are English language learners. And um, I've been in the field of education for well over 20 years. And um, so that's kind of what brings me to APH. I've always wanted to work here. And so, and um, it's just a wonderful place. Um, and being a, a, a big part of the Connect Center uh, is really allowing us to, to reach a lot more people than I ever thought imaginable um, in my little corner of the world when I was out in the schools. So um, thank you all again for joining us. I'm going to um, introduce our first presenter this morning. Uh, Bill Robinson, and he's going to be presenting about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, an update on innovation and continued opportunity. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot about that myself. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of background on Bill, and then um, at, after this, after the session is done, I will email all of our participants um, a, a, a document that has everyone's um, extended bio so that you get a really good sense of, of the individuals who are presenting all this wonderful information to us today. But Bill is the State of Michigan Director of the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. Uh, in February of 2001, uh, Mr. Robinson was accidentally shot by a fellow hunter. 
um, a life flight to the Macon, Georgia Trauma Center saved his life. However, the accident left him without sight in his left eye and limited sight in his right eye. Um, Bill never lost his faith, hope, or the support of family. An accomplished C-suite executive, uh, Bill's employer chose to trigger his severance versus accommodating his disability. Uh, unfamiliar with vocational rehab or, or the skills of blindness, Bill embarked on a journey of restoration of his role as husband, parent, and business and community leader. So rehabilitation and blindness skills were eventually arranged through his disability insurance, and he began pas to passionately pursue sharing his wisdom, expertise, and, and life skills with business, individual clients, and nonprofits. Uh, Mr. Robinson accepted the position of the State of Michigan Director of the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons in July of 2016 and began serving in that role uh, September 26, 2016. So as the director, uh, he is responsible for uh, the state agency that provides vocational rehabilitation, individual living, I'm sorry, independent living, and employment training services to Michigan's blind and visually impaired residents through seven offices located throughout the state. So that's just a little bit of background about Bill. And so thank you so much, Bill. I'm handing it over to you. Well, thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here today um, and celebrate this um, conference and, and have an opportunity to speak. I just want to ask, I saw in the chat pop up, there's no captioning um, coming across or the interpreter. So um, is that being taken care of at this point? Do we know? This is APH again. And just to let you know, I am frantically working behind the scenes. Our captionist is uh, assigned and is on, but we're not seeing it. So please bear with us. And oh, I see that. Okay, so there is in the text in the chat box, there it is being streamed to another site. There is the link inside the chat box. I will make sure to manage that. Uh, thank you, Bill, for stopping so that we could make that clarification. Absolutely, and thank you for uh, taking care of that. I'm going to share my screen. Um, if I do this right. Um, Again, I'm from the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the National Council of State Agencies for the Blind. So I'm, in, I'm the incoming president for that. And I just wanna point out that we've got um, a number of standing committees that include employment transition, independent living, Randolph Shepard, and technology. And in the transition employment and technology area, those committees work very well together because, again, um, you, you really need to kind of blend those together in order to make sure transition is addressing the needs of the kids. I want to review real quickly um, a little bit of background on pre-employment transition services. So for those that are new to that term, I'll, I'll refer to it as pre-ETS. But the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act did um, require vocational rehabilitation to engage more deliberately in the classroom and work more collaboratively with the local education agencies. And if I were to summarize WIOA in a couple um, sentences, it would be about data and data reporting and outcomes, and also about collaboration. And we certainly see collaboration when it comes to pre-ETS. Initially, uh, pre-ETS was sold as a reserve and expend of the uh, vocational rehabilitation formula grant. So there was 15% of that grant that was put aside. And I think if you were to look back on vocational rehabilitation and how um, RSA and, and everyone reacted, <clears throat> it was really about ready, shoot, aim, right? We had all this money and we, the law became effective immediately. There was no transition. 
the regs, even though the law was signed into law um, in 14, the, the actual regs didn't come out until October of 2016. So many of the state vocational rehabilitation agencies were actually trying to figure this out with very little federal guidance at the time. And the way most um, general agencies addressed it, that for general disabilities is they were looking at um, contract services, the way most blind agencies addressed it is a lot of the blind agencies were already doing quite a bit in transition. It's just that we weren't looking at necessarily as much collaboration or innovation in programs as we see now. So just a, a quick review, um, there's five required activities and here's the opportunity really to collaborate. So job exploration counseling, um, in a virtual environment, um, that is a, a, a category that can be performed virtually because you can have um, job sites or individuals in different um, positions actually do a virtual exploration with the students. Work-based learning is a little harder right now because the states a lot of times are not completely open and there's a lot of restrictions. Um, so that's a little more challenging, but that was an important opportunity uh, to give our kiddos a chance to actually learn on the job and learn about what uh, employers or businesses require to them uh, in the future. And, you know, if you think about it, for most individuals, um, I know for myself individually, uh, when I turned 16, I was bagging groceries at Winn-Dixie in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I was already working. Well, a lot of our kiddos aren't, um, weren't having those experiences. So I think this is probably one of the most important required activities that we provide uh, in vocational rehabilitation. Uh, counseling on those post-secondary um, uh, educational programs, and uh, that is something that's easily performed again virtually, although it was being performed in person before. It's an important step. And I would say as we look at the coordination activities, it's important that that counseling on post-secondary educational programs is performed in conjunction with a, a VRC or vocational rehab uh, counselor at the IEP. Uh, why do I say that? Because uh, for one reason, uh, if the, uh, you know, the transition coordinator at the school along with the TCVI, the parents and everybody are there together and they're setting those goals without the VRC in the room or without vocational rehabilitation in the room, a lot of times there's a disconnect between um, what the parents expect and really what the success looks like for their student. And we always wanna set high expectations, but we don't wanna set unrealistic expectations that could lead to um, not only the student not being successful later on, but the student not being able to achieve competitive integrated employment on graduation. Uh, workplace readiness training, uh, develop those social skills and independent living skills, very important. I know, um, you know, that is something that's going on in the school systems, um, as well as uh, vocational rehabilitation steps in and partners with that. And then finally, instruction in self-advocacy and peer mentoring. Self-advocacy is really, really important, and, and I think when I speak to, um, you know, the individuals at our training center, whether they're independent living older blind VR clients or uh, pre-ed students, I always talk about, um, you know, the importance of being able to speak for yourself, to know what your rights are, to understand the IP or the IPE, if, if it's the case of uh, VR. Um, and to, to know how to make those choices and participate. 
And so I, I think this is one of the, uh, again, one of the very important uh, required activities. Um, coordination activities are both opportunity and innovation. So if you note, uh, the very first one is attending an IEP meeting uh, it, when invited. So again, if you're working with the kiddos, make sure you invite or remember to invite and give enough notice in advance for those uh, vocational rehabilitation counselors to come and participate. Uh, it's really a team effort and about collaboration and, and we do want to be there so that we can lend expertise. Um, also with the workforce development boards, you can see there, there's a lot of coordination with what we call the one-stop centers to help develop those work opportunities, internships. I think the weakness we have right now and the opportunity for the future is if you talk to most vocational rehabilitation agencies, there's really a lack of apprenticeships. So we're really trying to see how that can work uh, with CTE and how we can develop apprenticeships for our kiddos when they, um, for a post-secondary outcome, for instance. Um, also working with schools, again, if you look at uh, that section that's uh, cited there in IDEA, it's really a lot of the similar five required activities such as workplace readiness skills, for instance, and looking for uh, how to plan for work. So again, that's another coordination activity. And finally, at the, um, the last one is those person-centered planning meetings for those individuals that are receiving um, Medicare, uh, Medicaid supports. Then there's a whole list of authorized activities. And this is where I can get really, really excited. Unfortunately, to get to these activities and to actually put some money against these activities, you have to demonstrate to RSA um, that you have, a, you have capacity beyond doing the five required activities. So in other words, um, you have to show that you're expenditures related to providing the five required activities on a statewide basis, um, there's some money left over to do other things. But I, I think it's real important, and, and one of the things NCSAB has been asking RSA to do is to open up these authorized activities um, without having to go through a forecasting step because you can really see strategies here in training, educating, coordinating activities, um, you know, development of regional partnerships with LEA states or, or other uh, agency heads, which are the DSUs. Um, so there, there's really some exciting things that can happen here. Michigan is in the authorized activities area. Um, so we feel really, really uh, blessed to be able to get down into the area of expenditures. Um, so the slide I showed before, which was like the ready, shoot, aim. So where, where are we today? And it's really being more thoughtful and pragmatic about, you know, what, what we want to do with our pre ed dollars and how we want to leverage those. And one of the things that we really want to look at is when we're looking at PRETs uh, for our kids is, you know, we don't want to repeat programs. We don't want to duplicate programs that are maybe uh, provided by the local education agencies. So for instance, if a, a local education agency or Leah's doing a really good job at self-advocacy, why would VR come in behind that and do four or five programs in self-advocacy for that school year? We would be better serving those students if we were to, to poll those LEAs to say, what are you doing well? How does that fit within those five required activities? And how can we leverage our dollars to supplement what you're doing without a duplicate effort? 
And that's really, if you look at section 113 of WIOA, which is about pre-ads, that's really what the intent is. The first preamble of that law talks about coordination. So uh, my team and I, for instance, sat down and we've laid out kind of a three-year plan because it takes a while to, to turn the ship, right? Um, in terms of trying to weave in uh, those comparable services that the leaders are providing so that we have a true state wideness. So as we look at that, we want to really look at what we would call next gen pre-employment transition services. So some of the innovation we've done in the area of STEM, for instance, is we invited um, NASA scientists, including uh, the scientists behind the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, to come to Michigan and to our training center and actually work with the students for a full week of STEM camp. And in that um, camp, they built a model solar system through uh, 3D printers. They were using sound to understand the distance between planets. Um, and then they actually did a uh, trip to the planetarium where they had star charts in 3D and they were able to follow the, the uh, along with the narrative of the, um, overview of the solar system using these star charts. Pretty amazing, pretty incredible program. It's something that we continue to work and um, refine with our partner at San Diego State um, that works with NASA. We had an individual out of Illinois and one out of DC in Florida that we were working with. So that's an, that's an innovation. For instance, another innovation that we did with STEM, and again, we're trying to think about how to impact these students and make it meaningful to them and, and, and have them take away something from us that will complement what the, the school districts are doing. So another STEM um, project we had is we had a uh, session where we had the students come in to the training center and they built their own 3D printers. And part of that was they got to take th 3D printers with them. So we know one of the issues that we have with blindness is spatial concepts. And so with those 3D printers, if they're in um, a course and they need to understand what a um, geometric shape feels like they could print that out on their 3D printer and then tactically understand what that um, feels like and imagine what that uh, looks like. Um, so there are a number of things that the students use that for, um, including printing uh, Groot from the um, uh, movie uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So that was kind of a fun thing they did. Um, and so they, they had some fun and they did learn too as well, which is part of it, right? Also collaborative uh, efforts, you know, so really reaching out to our state partners, our workforce partners, our state educational agencies, local educational agency. So the transition coordinators, what we call TCBIs here in Michigan or TBIs. And, and trying to figure out how to put together either summer programs or, or current year programs during the school year to help those students in, in different areas. We've done some what we call intercompany or interagency um, cash transfer agreements with some of our school districts where we actually um, have them provide a little bit of the state match and then we um, use the federal match for that to supplement some of their programs in uh, transition and pre-employment transition services. And that's really a great example of collaboration. The other area that we're starting to collaborate on, although we're at the adult level, but we will move this down to the individual level is the customized employment area. And customized employment is really exciting because 
in that um, CE service delivery model as we look at transformational service delivery. You can use that in any um, model. And if you don't know a lot about customized employment, the, the front end is what's the really exciting piece. It's the discovery phase and learning those strengths, unique strengths, right, of those individuals we're serving and making sure we're leveraging those strengths with business or employers. Um, statewideness, again, I mentioned that, you know, looking at comparable services to make sure everyone is getting uh, those required, five required activities in some form or manner. And then finally, uh, the last two things is really, instead of focusing on the expend part of the law where we're spending money, we really need to look at the outcomes and work backwards and say, what do we want? What's our vision for uh, students? And our vision is for them to have a successful post-secondary outcome. Now that may be immediate employment, that could be community college, that could be um, you know, university or institutions of higher learning. Um, all of those are, are great options depending on those unique strengths of the individual, but there's also a pathway there. And for some students, we've set up some part-time um, community college courses so that they get kind of a taste of what it looks like to go to that next level, but not overload them with full course schedules so that they're set up if they're not ready for it, that we don't wanna set anyone up for failure. So there's that pathway to success that we try to look at for each individual kiddo that we serve. Um, alignment, there's some VR and IDA um, indicators that do align. Um, there's a great um, uh, fact sheet on that on the WinTech site, and I can uh, make sure that Alea has that to send out to everyone. And then finally, um, I just want to point out in our performance metrics, I know this is a little hard to see, but I highlighted something called measurable skill gains. And you know, that can be a high school diploma, that can be a CTE certificate, um, it can be a number of things. But the, the thing is, is VR and education are both interested in that metric, right? Um, and it's important for us because this is really the first year in our program year starting July 1 of 2020 going through fiscal year 2021 that RSA has negotiated with each state VR agency uh, an attainment level for measure, measurable skill gains across the students we serve. So we are actually now being held very much accountable to making sure our students do have measurable skill gains. They do achieve some level of educational attainment or post-secondary credential and that we're measuring that and reporting that back to RSA. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Alea. Uh, there is my email in case you need it. It's Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N, W7 at michigan.gov. And again, it's been both a pleasure and an honor to participate in, in the conference today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I, I just, I always am fascinated by the things I don't know. <laughs> and, and just really appreciate you sharing all of that wonderful um, information. Um, and I know event, in, in the future, we'll have you back um, to uh, present some more uh, information and some training for us on Career Connect. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to, Ro Ro I was gonna say Robert, Richard. <laughs> It's still early. Well, not as early as it is for Richard, but <laughs> I'll, hand it back to... All right. <laughs> I'll hand it over to Richard and uh, he can uh, introduce our next, um, our next presenter.
We got it. you got to unmute too, Richard. <laughs> I think you are you trying to unmute? Okay. I can go. I can do it if you're having trouble. Okay. So um, our next speaker, um, while we work through technical uh, difficulties, uh, our next speaker is uh, Robert uh, Schillenberg. Did I say that correctly, Robert? Um, Rob, please. Rob. Okay, Rob. Um, and um, let me give you a little bit of background on- oh, Elias. Oh, oh, there you are, Richard. Hi. Something happened on my screen. I apologize. Um, oh, no, no worries. Two, two, let me back up two quick things. Okay. Do, were there questions in the chat box for William? Because he has another 10 minutes if, if he wanted them. Were there any hot topic questions for him? Uh, Amy, maybe? So I am taking a peek and checking and- so there, there is a question that just, um, it was almost on cue. <laughs> so, so glad that you asked, it was almost on cue. Um, what would be three key strategies to help schools become more engaged with VR and blind rehab services? Great question, I appreciate that. Um, the first strategy would be making sure that when an IP is scheduled, that you, you are reaching out to either the VR agency, if you don't know who the counselor is um, in that area, or reaching out to the counselor if you know the counselor that's working in your school district, because that really marries that collaboration for that student. The, the other thing I think that is very important is that, um, there's an education piece and making sure everybody understands the terms and what um, VR is doing in your state. So if, if you haven't a good knowledge of the pre ETS program in your state, I think that's another thing because knowledge is always power. So to learn a little bit about what your state agency is doing in that area, some of the programs, uh, the terminology they're using to make sure you understand, because we, we all have our acronyms, right? And, and when we're talking, a lot of times, we don't always talk the same language. We're using English, but we don't understand each other because we're using different terms. So make sure you understand that. And then finally, um, I think the third area is, um, there, you know, and this one may be a little more difficult sometimes, but um, see if there's a way to, to really coordinate services um, so that you're looking at what you're providing and what your school district is providing and then reaching out to your VR agency to say, hey, you know, we really could use a program that promotes more work-based learning in this area. And, and, or we can use more uh, help with um, maybe uh, job exploration. If you're not using it, um, the uh, Career Index Plus is free. And that's a great uh, thing for job exploration. The, the student, is the owner of that when they sign up for it. They may need a little bit of technical help to do it, but it is, we, we work closely with TCI Plus and we are a um, technical advisor for making sure it's accessible for blindness. Um, but make sure you look at that program or that tool because you just Google TCI Plus because What's really cool about that is the student can invite others to look at what they're looking at from a job exploration standpoint. And it's great if the VR counselor, um, the TCI or the TVI, I say TCVI, because that's what we refer to as TVIs in Michigan, um, or the transition counselor is a member of that student's um, TCI plus account which they would have to invite you. But again, 
the advantage of that is everyone can kind of see, well, the student's looking at, um, you know, veterinarian assistant. Um, and you can say, well, is that a labor market index supported career? Um, you know, what's the job outlook? And then in that TCI plus, it will say what the normal accommodations are for that particular uh, career. Won't, won't necessarily be real specific, but in general, it will give you some ideas. Thanks for that question. And we do have time for one more if there's anything in the chat box, Amy. Right now, we are good to go. I'm not seeing anything else, so I would say forge forward and All we'll right. see what else accumulates. Um, great. Bill, thank you so much once again. We appreciate your, your wisdom and sharing your time with us this morning. Alaya, are you, are you with us? Yes, I am. I think what I'm going to have you do is um, I, I'll introduce the next few speakers, but I'll have you read their bios because um, you can probably okay. faster sure. than I. So go ahead and read the bios and then I'll, 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 I'll put the personal touch, <laughs> if you will. All right. Um, uh, Kathleen, and, and are you on mic? And Rob, are you on mic? Just want to double check. I sh can you hear me? This is yes. Kathleen. I'm on mic then. Great. And Rob? Rob, what is it? I am on my, sorry, I'm having a, my internet's going in and out just a little bit, but I'm trying to get a hold of it. Good. Yeah. All right, Alaya. Thanks, guys. Okay. Okay. Um, so Kathleen and Rob will be talking about all work experience is valuable. Um, and yes, I totally agree. <laughs> All work experience is very valuable. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Rob and then I'm, I'm going to ask Kathleen to give uh, just a little bit of background on herself. Uh, I don't, I don't have a, a paragraph to go off of. So Kathleen will be her best representative here <laughs> to talk about herself, but I will, uh, I will give you a little bit of background on Rob. Um, so <clears throat> Rob has over 30 years experience in youth leadership and special education. Um, his CV includes special education policy development um, and as a Peace Corps volunteer and nine years teaching in Arizona at the School for the Blind, uh, where he held teaching credentials in VI, English, and cross-categorical uh, high incidence disabilities. He has run uh, internship, mentor mentorship, and transition programs for the blind uh, for Wayfinder Family Services, and now serves as Executive Director for Disability Solutions International, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting equity for persons with disabilities in their community in the U.S. and around the world. Rob is an avid traveler, writer, and photographer. So welcome, Rob, and thank you for uh, being a part of our presentation today. And um, Carol, if you want to give us... Kathleen. Some I'm sorry, Carol. Kathleen, <laughs> I can't read this morning. Uh, if you want to give us a little background on yourself. It's all good. My mother's name is Carol, so how fun. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was channeling, right? She was channeling. She was channeling. <laughs> Trust me, my mother's never awake at this hour. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. I finally got into the right link. I apologize. I logged in as a participant and then fortunately Rob saved me and called me and said, check the other link. So here I am. Oh, yeah. oh great. So, great. Welcome from uh, sunny Southern California. I'm Kathleen Coombs. I am a rehabilitation counselor with the California Department of Rehabilitation. Currently, I am actually no longer working with blind students. I'm working with students with all other disabilities, uh, as I just transferred about six months ago. But out of my 15 years with the Department of Rehab, almost 13 of them were working in the Blind Field Services Division. Um, we all, Rich and I and Rob, we all go back a really long way, especially me and Rich. Um, Rich and I, for many years, have coordinated the California Transition Council together. Now it's called the Forum. And um, it's been a, quite a journey of outreach with him. But my background, just a little bit, is this is my 31st year in the field uh, serving people with disabilities. Out of that 31 years, 15 have been with the Department of Rehabilitation. 
My bachelor's degree is from San Diego State as well as my master's degree. I also have a certificate in um, youth and uh, transition and employment from the University of Maryland, and I am now a certified yoga instructor. So I have a lot of hats. <laughs> so, and, and Kathleen and Rob, thank you guys again. I, I'm going to hand it back off to you in just a second. You guys have the better part of an hour until about maybe 30, 35 past the next hour, and then we'll have Ann come on. So if you want to infuse questions from the chat box or however you guys want to pitch it, that's fine. But I do want to say thank you both. Um, I've known Rob since 1993 when we were camp counselors at Camp Bloomfield in uh, Malibu and then Kathleen, as she said, for over 15 years. And, and we've got some really wicked, fun, and smart people on this next presentation uh, to all the viewers out there. And so you know, take advantage of, of their time and expertise and put questions in the chat box because Rob and Kathleen really know what they're talking about and they have the research and the data and the experience to, to back it up. So um, as you listen with your third or fourth cup of coffee, know that you're in for a treat, as am I, and I can't thank you both enough. Uh, and as Kathleen said, we've worked and, and ran around the state together for over 15 years ago. So it's, it's great to have you back, Kathleen. It's great to have you, Rob. Uh, take it away. Um, uh, Kathleen, if you don't mind, uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, just kind of give a shout out and acknowledge uh, uh, two of the folks uh, on this call. First of all, um, Bill, uh, I really appreciate if, if you're still on the call, uh, everything you've had to say. I don't know you, but I know of you. And uh, it was a pleasure getting to hear you speak today. And I really need to just reinforce with everybody uh, that when a man who's blinded in a hunting accident comes out of the gate with a slide that says, ready, fire, aim, you need to pay attention to what this man has to say. And so, you know, jumping off of what he uh, shared with us, and Bill, thank you, my hat goes off to you. Uh, we we want to build from the uh, discussion of the WIOA, because what we've got here uh, that Bill pointed out is a situation where um, the hardest thing to be doing during a time of COVID is going to be those work-based learning experiences as part of the PREATS package. And as we know, even when someone stops being pre ETS qualified, uh, all those five employment, uh, pre-employment skills don't stop being pre-employment skills just because you're no longer in high school or you turn 23. Um, I also want to um, uh, give a shout out uh, to my good friend, Eric Guillory, who I see in the, uh, the list of attendees here today. Eric and I talked together at the School for the Blind in Arizona. And sir, it is a pleasure um, to, to have you in this session with me. And thank you uh, for that. Um, we need to catch up again uh, soon, but thank you uh, for joining us here today. Um, uh, so with that said, um, I'm going to pass it off to Kathleen to kind of give us a little bit of context, but I would just like to encourage folks, please, as we go on, if the moderators for the room can uh, monitor the chat box and we can take questions on the fly as we go, we want this to be uh, not so much a lecture as a discussion. Uh, you're joining Kathleen and I for a discussion on this topic that we're both very passionate about. And, uh, you know, help us be part of that with you. Help be part of that with us. Uh, so uh, Kathleen, let's, let's get the ball rolling and start talking about uh, work-based uh, experiences and learning opportunities. All righty, thank you, Rob. So, you know, um, as Rob has said, there's a basis in, you know, law and legislation for why we uh, provide work-based learning. It's not just for the value of it, but there is actually a legislative mandate as part of WIOA. So as was discussed in the previous pres presentation, the five pre-employment and training services that are, that are identified, work-based learning is one of them. Work-based learning can take place in different forms. It can be paid work experience. It can be unpaid work experiences. It can be internships. It can be mentorships. It can be doing job shadowing. It can be doing informational interviews, taking tours. It can, it can take various forms. But today, we're actually really focused on why it is so important for young people to have paid work experiences as part of that work-based learning. And also to emphasize that, just like all teenagers, 
uh, they're not going to necessarily have work-based learning experiences that closely align with their intended career goal. As it wasn't for me, I'm pretty sure that when I was a bus girl at age 17, that was not my career aspiration, but I learned a lot from that. So I'm going to ask you first as an audience to step back a little bit and, and connect with your younger teenage self. It's a horrible experience, I get it, but try to go back in time and go, what was it like to be 15, 16, 17 years old? How did my brain work at that stage of my life? Well, I can tell you as a mom of a 13 year old now, <laughs> the brains don't always work so great as we want them to. And there's a lot about judgment <laughs> that doesn't really come as part of the package, right? We the have frontal lobe is not completely the, developed. It, it, That's it, part it, of the problem. At the, time, <laughs> at the time, we know we're geniuses. Uh, exactly. We know everything. Absolutely. Perspective, age gives us perspective and through that wisdom, but at the time, we are geniuses. Absolutely. And, and I, I saw that with yep. my now 20-year-old, and I'm now witnessing it again with my 13-year-old. It's oh, really boy. quite pretty. So <laughs> time and try to remember what you were like at that age and uh, that may have been a time that you were actively avoiding all of life's responsibilities or you were racing to the to, to adulthood every kid is kind of somewhere different along the spectrum but what every kid doesn't have is those skills yet that are needed to be successful in their designated their desired career and so this time period 16, 17, 18 years old. It's all about getting real experience in life that's going to prepare you for the next stage. Like everything is like, you know, building blocks, right? And so those, those work experiences that you have when you're young are those building blocks. And mm -hmm. we actually start the idea of work really when kids are little, when we start to give them chores and responsibilities, and then we incrementally increase the responsibility with those things as they get older and increase our expectations of them. And so then we arrive at work. And so, so I, go I, ahead. You, yeah, you know, this, it, I, I gotta tell a story because I, I like to tell stories, but uh, also because, uh, because Richard's in the room. And now, now uh, like what you said, this was, this was critical, right? That we, these are skills that we're learning. Right. You can never expect anyone to know something they've never been taught. You can never expect anyone to know something or understand something they've never experienced. And uh, uh, here's Richard and I meeting each other for the first time in the summer of 1993. You got to know I was going to tell this story. Right. And uh, it's not it's not a it's not it's not a bad one. It's a story of, of great success and triumph. And there were two uh, handsome heroes in it. And and what happens is that. Uh, here we are. Now, Richard and I, at this point in our lives, having never met each other, had had some work experiences, uh, you know, a, a to date. Richard has a wonderful story about working for Carl's Jr., which right. I'll let him <laughs> talk about on his panel. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I was raised in a household, like Kathleen was saying, you know, we work begins at, as, as little kids. And I was raised in a household where the idea of um, being a teenager was that you're practicing to be an adult, and that meant that you go out and, do, and try to do those things that adults do. And, and so by this point in my life, I had never really held down a job. I had some campus jobs in college uh, by that point, and I had had uh, jobs that I found for myself around the neighborhood, you know, uh, doing some babysitting, some handyman work, some yard work. But this job, working as a camp counselor at Camp Bloomfield in Los Angeles, Malibu area, that was the first real legit job that I had. And I don't know how Richard feels about it, but here he and I are, uh, the protagonists of our story, two of seven, uh, uh, I'm sorry, nine visually impaired people uh, at working as camp counselors that summer. There were nine of us, and Richard and I were two of them. And by the end of the summer, we were the only two visually impaired camp counselors left. And it was like Survivor before Survivor was on TV because this was, you know, 20 something years ago, uh, a little bit before Survivor. But people were getting voted off the island every week. 
And, and we were sitting there at the end of the, at the end of the summer going there, but for the grace of God, where did they go? And, and we, we thought about it. Now this was interesting because it's going to tie into our presentation here. We're talking about how no such thing as a fake job, no, no useless work experience. And, and, what you know this is going to come back again when we get to our third talking point but here we are Richard and I weren't planning on being camp counselors for the rest of our lives right. um, I, I knew I was going to be a high school teacher which I kind of sort of did by the time I got into my uh, seventh year of teaching uh, fifth year of teaching um, you know when I was teaching English not not history like I had planned like our plans always work out right but right. but uh, what did happen is that we had enough of a wake up call. I did go into special ed instead of mainstream education. And Richard, you took a, a, a tour in the, in the, the rehab field and, and worked right. for the state right. and then went into nonprofit work. And, and uh, you know, we've talked about this for 20 years about how this has been, you know, it's so impactful uh, not just our success, great, great handsome heroes that we were this summer, but the, uh, uh, the, the fact that there were so many lessons learned in how our compatriots weren't, weren't surviving, and it was just a shock to the system. Uh, and without that summer job, I don't know that I would have had a career, and, and it was that significant. Um, it, so many lessons there. So, um, you know, again, this is where I hand it back to Kathleen, because she's got the notes and she keeps me honest. Uh, so, <laughs> a nice what, meeting to be honest, Rob. <laughs> so, so, going back still with our planned exercise of just remembering what you were like at that age, if you are parents, remembering how your own children are. And one of the things that we uh, have talked about as professionals is, you know, where we don't want to, we're not in the business of a dream crushing not by any stretch of the imagination, but we are in the business of reality making <laughs> and yeah. being reality centered. And so we, the reason we started this, started talking about this workshop was because we, we're kind of walking a dual line here, right? On the one hand, we're saying to families, tell us, and we're saying to young people, tell us what your dreams are. We wanna help you achieve those dreams. But at the same time, we don't want to establish the expectation that that's all we do. Because we, we will have a young person maybe that has a really, you know, fabulous, exotic career aspiration, but it isn't realistic that their first job is going to be a match to that. And we don't want mm -hmm. families to think that they have wasted their time in work experience that isn't closely aligned with that because there's the foundations. And in those foundations is where we learn those life lessons, those work lessons, build that work ethic, develop a lot of those critical skills that are needed to continue to pursue the career goal of interest and to be successful in it once you arrive there. And so that's kind hey, of what today's workshop is about. Go ahead, Rob. I love that you brought up work ethic because, you know, regardless of whatever job you're going to be in, uh, we throw the word soft skills around a lot, uh, like we know what it is. And the, and the reality is, is that a lot of us don't, uh, and, and a lot of us have an idea. Um, out, out here in, in California, we, we put a lot of work on, Richard and I actually put a lot of work on this uh, at one of our former jobs, uh, where we collaborated on this project uh, with Transition Age Youth, looking at what were soft skills and what we came up with was that if you got hard skills, which are the skills you need to complete a task and soft skills are the skills you need, skills, things you can learn, right? Skills that you need to be able to work with other people to get things done. And, and as we, we were doing the research, came down to four uh, basic categories, um, critical thinking, uh, social rapport, uh, collaboration, and yes, work ethic. And, and it's, it's so critical. It's like you can't, it's like having a four-legged stool with a leg missing. That stool won't stand up. And, and so having that work ethic, the, the, the skills that demonstrate that you value work, right, that's, that's going to be applicable in any job experience, any job opportunity, whether it's your forever job or your summer job. 
those skills have to be trained and experienced and built up like you're strengthening a muscle. And these are things like show up, show up on time, show up on time every day, be able to self-supervise, be able to accept criticism uh, and, and apply the feedback, right? Uh, ask good questions, um, show that the job matters. And so as we look at the uh, uh, greater domain of soft skills, looking at these subdomains becomes really critical because we want to make sure that if there's deficits in, is this person showing good judgment, common sense, threat sense, uh, uh, problem solving skills? Is this person able to collaborate, negotiate? Uh, is this person able to form relationships, right? And this is why soft skills aren't just social skills, right? Because we've all worked with that person that we like that we don't want on our committee, okay? And you're allowed to laugh out there in, in virtual land. Uh, it's true and we know it. And, and so this is why, you know, that social rapport is critical to soft skills, but it's not just social skills. It's all these other things that allow us to work with others to get it done and it's all foundational in these early job opportunities. Very good points, Rob. And just to make sure you touched on all the points you wanted to discuss under this category of uh, the soft skills, uh, you had it under kind of a general category of emotional resiliency and self-advocacy. Um, our, our curriculum for transition does look at hard skills, soft skills, and emotional resiliency mm -hmm. all, all together. And, and I, I would argue that in any transition curriculum, you want to have that emotional resiliency component as well. The, uh, the skills related to patience, discipline, tolerance of risk, and uh, uh, contingency planning. And uh, because these allow people to take the locus of control upon themselves, uh, within a support system, an effective support system that allows them to master their environment. This is outside the scope of soft skills, but it's just as critical. And these can also be trained while people are doing work experience. Absolutely. And we're going to get on to some real life uh, scenarios of accountability, but I, in my own life space as a mom of a kid that had his first jobs in, in high school, I can talk about my kid that's typical, has no disabilities, about the, the, the importance of emotional resiliency in the workplace and the importance of demonstrating a work ethic um, and how building those skills was so necessary for him and his next job. So his very first job was at a ski resort. He would come home every weekend telling me about the slobby customers and the one guy that takes an hour just to vacuum a patch of carpet in the lobby and how the boss yelled at him. And, and, you know, one of the things I always would say to him is, you know, in life, not everybody's going to talk to you the way you want to be spoken to. And you got to find a way to deal kid, <laughs> you know, and one yeah. of the things you might see young people say a lot as my son often did is I'm just going to quit. I'm, I don't deserve to be treated this way. I'm just going to quit my job. And um, that's where that emotional resiliency piece takes, comes in and teaching them that work ethic of, well, you don't just up and quit a job because you got upset because somebody didn't talk to you the way you think you should have been spoken to. And you don't quit a job unless you have another job lined up. <laughs> so... Well, and yeah, right. And this is, this is where self-advocacy is critical because... Um, when when we look at self-advocacy, there's a couple of things happening here. In some ways, self-advocacy is the absolute manifestation of your soft skills because it's your ability to get what you want while building relationships. If you don't have those things happening, um, you might get what you want, but it's kind of a self-advocacy fail. You know, if you're able to cross a lot of rivers, but you don't have any bridges left behind you, uh, you know, you, you really kind of limit your options in life. Uh, speaking about leaving jobs without a backup, I'm going to dime out my older brother, Tom, a guy I shared a bunk bed with for 15 years, uh, who's never going to hear this presentation. Uh, but uh, It's recorded. Richard's we met, could get it to him, you know. We could true. get it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's met Tom. Uh, so the thing with the thing with Tom, he worked at a restaurant called St. John's out in San Jose. It's uh, owned by the same folks who, who uh, start Armadillo 
armadillo willies for anyone out in uh, the San Jose area. I see you, Amy June. And uh, the uh, uh, he was working out there as a sandwich place, and uh, he said he wanted 25 cent a raise. Um, a 25 cent an hour raise, this is back in the early 80s, so this was actually decent money to get a raise for. And the guy says, the owner says, hey man, you've been here for like a month and a half. And he goes, I'll tell you what, let me do my job for 30 days. This is the way Tom operated. Let me do my job for 30 days. If, if I do this job for 30 days and you don't have to tell me once to, to work, get to work, what to do, or correct me on anything I've done, and I get that raise. And the guy says, sounds like a good deal. And he's thinking he's got money in the bank. 30 days later, Tom has his raise because challenge accepted. And he's a Schollenberg and that's what we do. So he's got his raise and he goes on uh, for another few months and a new guy gets hired and Tom finds out somehow that this guy's making more money starting than Tom's making now with his new raise. And Tom says, I've been here longer than this guy. You know, I'm a harder worker. I should be getting paid more than him. I want to be paid at least 10 cents an hour more than the new guy. And the owner says, I'm sorry, it's not the budget. I can't do it. And Tom took off his apron and walked out. Here's the other thing about self-advocacy. When we talk about matching skills and passions in the workplace uh, and in career planning, we also have to talk about someone's moral compass. Uh, because when you have a sense of what's right and wrong, and when you have a sense of what your kids find to be right and wrong, you're going to soon learn what is intolerable for them. And when you can key in on what's intolerable, that's where self-advocacy begins. Tom hit that threshold. And it might not have been a great one because there were bridges being burned, right? But he, he knew where his threshold was. That was his trigger. And, and, and he moved on with his life. Um, and, and so for all of our kids, when we're looking, you know, the, the first element is speaking up to get your needs met. The refined masterclass of self-advocacy is could he have done it and built a relationship? Absolutely. I like that story a lot. Um, and we talked about when we were planning our our time here together, we also talked about some real scenarios of accountability at a job. So one of the things that I often see with young people is that they are short-sighted about what this job today means for the future. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a young person say, well, it doesn't matter if I quit this job, I don't actually need this reference. <laughs> right? So you have a young person who like Rob described, the guy that- I mean, Richard's I reaction. I heard my own son say that about, I think he has said that now about three of his jobs. I don't need this job for, for reference. Yeah. I can put something else down. They don't- That connect kid's a anything. genius. Right, yeah. so <laughs> my kid's great too. He's just, that frontal lobe is not fully developed yet. He's not- <laughs> nope. Neuroscience would support your claim. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's something else is that our kids need to learn that each of these experiences is either their opportunity to build their future and build their reputation and build who they want people to know that they are, or they can also use it as an opportunity to build the reputation of what people decide that they are and what is going to happen to them if they, if they make that choice instead. So, this is what, why foundational work experiences, every single one of them is so critical because they become an opportunity, each one upon the next is for that kid to decide, who am I gonna be in this scenario? I often have conversations with young people um, about who you wanna be and what you wanna be known as. These are the same questions we wrestle with as an adult. And we take it a lot more seriously at this age because we have, we have, we have the value of 2020 hindsight and we also have the value of knowing for some of us that it's possible we have fewer years ahead of us than we have behind us. And we, we get it now that like our reputation and who we have built ourselves to be is so valuable, so critical. But young people, they haven't made that connection yet because like they're, you know, they're gonna live forever. Nothing's ever gonna take them out. Everything's always gonna be golden and work out. You know, they don't understand well, they all that goes with it. <laughs> 
It doesn't, it doesn't take foundational stacking. I had a friend of mine as teenagers when we were geniuses, uh, you know, we were watching some movie and there was this quote that said, everything you do in life is a portrait of yourself. Sign your work with excellence. And my friend vowed on that day that he was going to legally change his name to Excellence Hoffman. And, um, oh, sorry, Kathleen. Uh, but, and, and, and I'm like, it's not that easy, man. Uh, <laughs> oh my so it's gosh. tough because you know what? They're so funny. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what saves teenagers is their sense of humor. But they do right. have, you know, I, I had these conversations with my stepson and with my own son more than once where I'd say, do you want to be known as the kid that skirted around all the rules and was clever? Or do you want to be known as the one that understood what those rules were and followed them and could be counted on to be honest? And so these are value conversations that come really to the front when we're in work situations. Because it's all about what is your value system and how are you going to manifest it and how are you going to carry that into the future? So it really plays strongly into what Rob was saying you know, about developing that work ethic, those soft skills that include that work ethic and include that emotional resiliency. And also teaching our young people that in those situations, you don't make rapid decisions. You make thoughtful decisions. You don't act mm -hmm. on your impulses because that's what teenagers are all about is acting on their impulses, their emotional impulses. And what teenagers don't understand is that this moment you have in time it's not forever. This is just a blip, you know, mm -hmm. and this plays in when we talk about mental health issues and why we are so yeah. concerned about young people harming themselves or even the, at the very worst taking their own lives because they do not understand that where you are today, this is just an, a, a, a tiny spot in your history and it's going right. to be gone. It's going to pass and you're going to be okay. They don't always understand that. And so they make impulsive decisions. They may lose their tempers. They may say things that they don't mean to say. They may hastily quit jobs. So these are things that we need to teach them also as part of that resiliency. It gets, yeah, right, exactly that emotional resiliency component again, because again, we're talking about patience, which is delayed gratification. We're talking about willpower, which you know is basically discipline. Rob's definition of discipline is doing what you gotta do when you don't wanna do it, all right? That's actually Rob's dad's definition of discipline, but I'm, I'm co-opting it at this point. And then, uh, uh, you know, the tolerance, tolerance of risk is, is kind of important about what we're talking here, but the contingency planning and the patience is critical. This is why any curricula you want to be developing for any of these things, you want to build in the ability for people to be late, get lost, and fail. Uh, there, there's this great quote from a Japanese businessman I love that says, the only difference between the master and the student is the master has failed more times than the student has ever tried. If we don't work in opportunities to fail and make it real, uh, the, the students aren't going to have the ability to respond to that. Uh, it's like tender newborn skin getting poked uh, and the people who've developed a callus doesn't bug them anymore. Hey, Rob and, and Kathleen. Yes, sir. Um, just with 20 minutes to go and talking about opportunities, I wanted to see if you guys had, you wanted to see if there were any questions from the chat box, just to acknowledge that. Oh, Come yes, please. If there are any coming in, please flag us on the fly. Go ahead. You're good. I kind of chime in with that. Yeah, no, no, right on. And we will, we will have time in a few minutes for, uh, for Q and A, definitely. If if uh, no one can think of anything right now, there will be time at the end. Um, so, uh, yeah. So these these ideas of not just being able to work with other people, but the idea that you can refine refine towards perfection. You know, where we always aim for perfection, knowing it will not be achieved, but we know that we will reach excellence along the way if that is our ultimate goal. And so giving them that ability to stumble and know that's all right, it will be making them stronger. It's just like weight training or any other thing where you're setting a goal and you gotta build a muscle or learn a skill, practice and develop to get your mastery. 
And going along with that, you know, the next thing that we said we would talk about is, you know, some examples, some real world examples. We've already given a few, but I know that, Rob, you had a young student whose parents were pretty upset that you guys found a paid work experience for him that wasn't aligned with what he wanted to do, which was going into, I think, graphic design. Right. Yeah. Media arts. And the student had never, student had never worked before and he's uh, going on 18 that summer and he's going into a residential internship program we were running at the time. And uh, we, we had an opportunity to place him with a marketing department uh, within our agency. And, uh, but, but that's getting ahead of myself a little. What ended up happening first in the negotiation stage back in the spring, uh, so we sat down with the family and they were excited. My son's gonna get a job this summer. Our son's gonna work. And these are parents who own their own business. And so they kind of have the, the sense of work ethic, right? And they also have a sense of where their son was at in terms of work ethic. And, and so I was su surprised when I said, you know, your kid really likes working out. He's really good with people. Uh, we were thinking of placing him at a local gym. Uh, we placed someone there last summer. It was really successful. That guy's working in an office this, this year. And uh, they, they, they said, okay, that sounds good. And they came back to me two hours later and said, we talked about it and we will pull him out of your program if you give him a job at the gym. His career goal is media arts. His career goal is is something with uh, graphic design or photography, and this isn't going to meet his needs at all. And they were they were incensed. Really, they worked themselves up a full lather. I'd never seen anyone actually have a lather, uh, and and this they were lathery. And and so when we 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 sat down again with the with the whole team and we said, okay, we can offer him this, but we can't start the marketing job until three weeks into the summer. So he'll have to take an office job on campus in another department, then go to the marketing job. All right. Well, he goes to the office job. That lasted about a week and a half. He was persistently late. Um, hour long, half hour long lunches. Those were things that happened to other people. After his second hour and a half long lunch, they let him go. They called us up and said, we're sending him home. He, please don't send him back tomorrow. And, and we had a, a nice discussion uh, with him uh, back at our, our residential site about what can we do better? What did you learn? Um, and and what, what can happen next time? Because you still have this marketing job coming up. Uh, which he lasted about a week in. Uh, he wasn't managing his sleep schedule. We had an all staff training. He fell asleep twice before lunch. It was like set up like dinner theater. Uh, this this all staff training that they, they had the presenter up at top, uh, up at front. We were in our auditorium. We had these little round tables with centerpieces, and and he just kind of <laughs> head goes down. And and after the second time, his his boss came over and said he's sleeping over there. We had to wake him up because he started to snore. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Just send him home when, at the end of the day. Uh, and and he was done. So we pulled him out of that. We focused for the rest of the summer on things like ILS and budgeting. Uh, we made it work. We pivoted. But coming out of that program with his parents saying this was a failure, he found work two months later um, as an extra in the film and television industry. It was a weird kind of pivot, but he got to do something with creativity and performance uh, and, and self-expression. But he told us that it was failing those two jobs and realizing that there were consequences for what was happening to him that helped him get the job he had and keep it. Because if he didn't show up at the right spot at the right time, uh, they might not, like the bus wouldn't be there to take him to the, to the set or wherever they were filming that day. And, and he had to really quickly, if he wanted to keep his job and get his SAG credit, these were all things he had to do. And he knew it would happen because if we were going to fire him, those other people sure as heck were going to fire him. And, and so this is how our program became successful uh, by getting a student fired twice from a job he wasn't ready for. Uh, not the program we would have designed, but we were, you know, we were able to make it work. The student was open to the experience, which at the end of the day is why it worked. Well, and he, he developed that insight that now he's going to carry forward for the rest of his life of, you know, 
if I do these things, I will lose employment. I, I have other examples of other students with disabilities that aren't vision impaired, but have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, you know, as part of their work, you know, as part of the workability program and out here in California, we have the transition partnership program, which is a partnership between Department of Rehab and um, different school districts and SELPAs to to deliver these training uh, services, the pre-ETS and also the work-based learning. But, you know, a lot of those jobs require those students to have uniforms. And their rule in that program is if you show up without parts of your uniform, you can't clock in. <laughs> That's really yeah. powerful, you know? That seems like a really basic skill and for that population it may be, but honestly, it's a really basic skill for almost any teenager that wants to put their stamp of individuality on and want to wear their own thing to work. And maybe they just conveniently forget their apron at home or maybe they forget to wear the right shoes. And there, there's always a consequence for all those choices. So uh, like you said, Rob, give them the room to make those decisions and experience the real life consequences that accompany them. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw myself under the bus on this one, Kathleen, because you know that is true. And even like me in my late 20s, I'm now doing my forever job. I'm working at the School for the Blind in Arizona. And, and it was kind of a rough transition for me. I had a lot to learn, a lot of, of disciplines to dial in. Uh, I, had, I, I had what I like to think of as the raw talent of being a, an educator, uh, but definitely the, the polish wasn't uh, quite there yet, many of my colleagues would say. Uh, but, but in reality, in all seriousness, I was pulled aside by a coworker one day. It wasn't Eric, uh, but it was someone in our department who said, hey, man, you got to know, uh, you know, we know that you're frustrated that you don't always feel like you're being treated with respect, but you know, you show up to work with, you know, your khakis wrinkled, your shirts wrinkled, uh, you know, it, it looks like you slept in your clothes. And I said, I really appreciate you sharing this with me. And then I went home and spoke to my wife at the time. That's a key bit of foreshadowing. Uh, and I said, sweetheart, um, you know how when I leave the house every day and I ask, how do I look? And you say, fine we need to change our criteria for mastery on this because it's not, it's not getting through to the people at work that I look fine when it, they're saying I look like I slept in my clothes. We need to like do better with the ironing. I ended up do, do ironing my own clothes after that. I ended up taking absolute control over what my wardrobe was looking like. And, and there was a shift and a change. Um, as a person who was visually impaired, I didn't have the, the feedback that I was, I was underperforming in that area. And when I got it, I was able to pivot, thank goodness. But it's the exact same situation you were saying, uh, not clocking in. That would have been a long walk home if I was told to go home, you don't look good enough to be at work. <laughs> That's a great story though. And in evidence, honestly, that this foundational skill, like you said, Rob, can carry right into your professional years and can kill a profession. And one well, and this, this is after 10 years of job experience, and now I'm actually in a career. A job, job's a job. Job means just over broke. I was in a career, all right? Yeah. <laughs> so that was the wrong time to be learning this. <laughs> I'm going to make a t-shirt that says job means just over broke. <laughs> Love it. I'm definitely going to make t-shirts. Rob is, uh, and I'll make sure and give you credit, Rob. <laughs> but something, I want to, something I want to add to that is um, going back to what we call soft skills, which as we can see, involves a lot of hard skills as well. But I always say to people that, you know, you, your skills get you in the door whatever those are that you can put on your resume, those hard skills, those things you've learned, you've gotten certified to do or whatever. But it is your soft skills that get you the job. It is your soft skills that help you keep the job. And it is your soft skills that enable you to advance in that job. And that is at For, for the sake level. of audio description, I just gave Kathleen the double guns on that. <laughs> yes. so that is at every <laughs> level from your very first job at say a fast food restaurant, all through your career. If you do not possess those skills, you do not advance, you do not achieve your career aspirations. So it's really, really critical that we remind people of that. Now I did a little bit of, I just wanna recap a little bit of research that I can send, I can put, type it into the chat for you guys so that you guys can go ahead and look on, on your own. But Rob referred me to um, a study 
it was a very small study. It only had 14 participants, but a study by Goodwin, Bell, and Singletary. And the title of their article is called Factors That Contribute to Success for Blind Adults. So it focused on the blind population. And what they did was they had two groups and they just interviewed these people uh, about first they established the criteria of what do you call your, you know, how do you define success? So they, as, as a group, they define success. And then they interviewed them about, well, how did you get successful? How did you achieve that success? What were those factors, yeah. Right, and they just allowed them to chat away, basically. So there was really no uh, study or way that it was done. Um, can, can I, am I audible? Because I just got a buzz up on no, my you're, computer. You're good. Yeah. So it sounds okay. like a right. focus group. Right. It, it sounds like it was a focus it, group. About it was it. two focus groups. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. They usually break them up into smaller groups. It's hard to do. Yeah. It was two right. groups of seven that they that they interviewed. Yep. What they yeah, found that right. was that universally the participants in each focus group had very similar, like there was lots of crossover of what they described as how they would define success and how they achieve success. So let's just talk briefly about those 13 factors that they identified. Well, I, I didn't write down and, all 13. And these are, I, these are ranked, and, and in the study, they rank them by, by uh, eminence. Uh, so what appears at the top of the list was considered most important or more significant than what's near the bottom. And that's important for what uh, we're about to hear. Yeah. So one of the things that people said contributed to their success was, first of all, having good role models and good mentors. So teaching our young people, how do you reach out? How do you connect with people that do what you want? And not just necessarily people that do what they want to do, but identifying people after whom they would like to model their own behavior. That can be another young person that's just, you know, excellent in a lot of ways, or it can be an older person. It can be a professional, it can be a teacher, but somebody that they look to and they say, that is somebody that I want to emulate, that I want to be like, that I can, that I can model good behavior after. Um, they talked about the importance of positive blind identity. So this is where your self-advocacy skills come in, your mm -hmm. emotional resilience comes in. Seeing yourself and your disability in a positive light. If you are actively grieving your disability, and that happens whether or not you were born with it, by the way. <laughs> but if you are actively struggling against it and you view it with negativity, that carries over into every part of your existence. And it's definitely going to interfere with your ability to be successful in your work. Because when you are hung up in that negativity, you can't actively problem solve. You can't be thinking about the next thing. Like that's like way low on Maslow's it, hierarchy. It impacts, right. It impacts your ability to, to get people to trust and like you. That's social yeah. rapport, right? Exactly. And that feeds directly in your ability to collaborate. Exactly. It, it just spills over into every area yeah. until you move forward with some positivity. Yeah. Um, Participation in advocacy bodies, groups. So having our, our young people go to the Youth Leadership Forum here in California, very important. Having them take advantage of, uh, if, if, if there are fellowships that come up in the capital of your, of your state or in Washington, D.C., if they can go to things like that, it really elevates them. Having them in leadership roles, having them collaborate with other students, you know, like every high school has a peer counseling program having them do stuff like that. But this is what they said really helped them because here's the thing, when you are placed in a position to lead, you do lead. And when you, when you, when you get on board with advocacy organizations, you, you step into that leadership role. You step into the role of helping other people try, you're all working towards this common goal and you all become leaders in one way or another. Yeah. People um, don't know they can be leaders until they have that opportunity. But true. this, but I discourage just putting everyone in a leadership program and saying everyone will now be a great leader. There's going to be points where people have to have the desire and the skills, but mm -hmm. they won't have that desire unless they have an expectation of success. I'm going to give you guys a five minute uh, hook. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then yeah. developing blindness specific skills translates loosely to you got to have those independent living skills. You have to, if you can't function well in your life independently, if you don't have good life management skills, you're not going to be successful in a job. 
that's critical. In, in, in curricula, we're going to see that manifest in hard skills as O and M and AT, uh, and compensatory academic skills that are related to actual like you know Braille and literacy and things like that. Um, if I could just jump us down a minute, because I want to have time for a question or two. Yeah. Near the bottom of that list, that's where it's fascinating to me, because near the bottom of that list is where we find social yeah. skills, critical thinking, yeah. right? And, uh, and collaboration. Expectations and expectations from the family. And this is something right. we've preached for years. I've always said to parents of kids with disabilities, have high expectations. We meet the expectations that are established for us. If you establish them low, we'll meet them low. If you establish them high, we will strive high. But, but you know, I always tell parents, don't give your kids a break just because they have a disability. If your right. child has a vision impairment, don't have the other kids clean the toilet. Your child has to learn how to clean the toilet unless you plan to Absolutely. do that for the rest of your child's life, you know? Nope. Nope. Also remember that teenagers are going to participate in revisionist hearing. So when, uh, uh, and I had a parent say to sit at a, 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 a conference, uh, Richard and I were sitting on a panel together, uh, I don't know, about three years ago, man. And uh, a family was, uh, God, was it five? Oh no. Um, but the, uh, the, the mom and the daughter are sitting next to each other and the mother, said, and the mother says, I just want her to know that I know she can do it. I just worry. And I said, now the thing is, man, when you say that, I worry you're saying, I just want her to be safe and happy. And your daughter's hearing, I don't think you can do it. And the daughter's sitting there nodding her head and the mom's going, I never thought of it that way. Uh, when we say what we say, the kids are gonna hear what they hear. And so if you eliminate the possibility for misinterpretation, be really clear. I would never ask you to do something I don't think you can do. Uh, I know you can do it. My insecurity is my insecurity. Um, I just want you to be safe and happy is a great alternative to, I just worry about you. And, and so those things are critical. Um, what was interesting for me about this study is that near the bottom of the list, we have those soft skills things. And as those who've looked into the research know, these are the four things that research says employers are looking for as much, if not more than the ability to do the job, the ability to work with others, the ability to solve problems, the abilities to, you know, that re are related to work ethic. And so we really need to dial in these skills because we need to show that they're valuable because that's the culture of employment. And we need to bridge from the culture of blindness to the culture of employment, the value of these skills. Yes, and one of the things that I just thought of, just to wrap it up, is that parents are, are scared to have their children experience the devastation of failure. So we have seen a history in our country of always telling young people with various disabilities, you know, you, you really, shouldn't do that or you really can't do that and it really is born of the fear of failure and their fear that it's going to break that kid that child's going to be teased that child's going to have a deflated sense of who they are whatever the fears are that are attached to that one of the things that i want to point out is that while we're talking about teaching emotional resiliency, the truth of the matter is they are already emotionally resilient and we've got to give them space to muscle, to, to develop that resiliency muscle. So, you know, my advice to parents is step out in the same kind of confidence that you have with your other kids who also make mistakes. That's why I talk about my kids that don't have disabilities because they all make mistakes and they all, in one way or another need us to pick them up and that's what we do as parents is we love them and we pick them up and we dust them off and we pat them on the bottom and say go off and do it again and we've <laughs> got to be able to say that to our kids with disabilities whether they're blind or have some other type of disability Kathleen, any, any, Rob, any scientist can tell you that diamonds are only formed in the greatest heat and pressure and if we're afraid to apply that to our students we're just gonna end up with a bag full of rocks. You know, your talk is more riveting than any morning show I've ever heard on radio. So I wish it could go on for four hours. 
Uh, are there, Amy, are there a question or two maybe we could, we could pull from the chat box? Otherwise we can, we can wrap it up. This is Aliyah before, before Amy hits yes. the chat box. <clears throat> I wanted to mention, you know, you, you were talking about like informing or you yourself, Rob, being informed that your clothes is wrinkled and those types of things. I think, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, I, I, from my experience, it is difficult, even though you're trying to help the person or your student understand that you're not being critical, like in a bad way, you're really there to try to help them, right? Like make sure that, that you wash your face in the morning so that, you know, your sleep is not in your eyes or you're brushing your, like, don't look like you just rolled out of bed right. you know? my, and you're going to go to work. So it's like, how do you make sure that that, that comes across, like, do I always tell my students, you, you find the trusted person that who you know has your best right. interest at heart. To, well, to and remember, you. all relationships are built on trust, and trust comes mm -hmm. from communication, and the greatest trust is going to come from communication of love and respect. My mom's family's from the South, and when I was very young, my spinster aunt, because she was from the South, mm -hmm. uh, took me aside and said, uh, you know, Robbie, you need to know this because I'm not going to be around someday to tell you when you're old enough. Uh, if a lady has something that ain't right that she can fix, you need to let her know. But okay. if it, there's nothing she can do about it, Don't it does me. not exist and you never bring it up. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a really good, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's it. When you can, when you know that a person's coming from a position of, I'm telling you this because I think you can fix it. And you've got right. that relationship. You have to establish it from a foundation of trust, like you said. Uh, right. We've got about a minute and a half. Uh, Amy, are there any questions? There are no questions at this time. There oh. things that have come in. You all have just very promptly, uh, jumped into that chat box and answered. There were some questions about the study and a link and Good. all of that has been addressed within. So you are caught up at this point. I, I did have a question about cultural uh, factors with the study. You mentioned uh, Kathleen about, you know, the independence and how we need to stress that. Like was culture at all talked about when it comes to that? Cause I mean, I'm Hispanic, I'm Puerto Rican, Mexican, my, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans are American, so, but my, on the Mexican yeah. side, I know that's all, I always have to clarify that, because on the Mexican side, they were first gen, mm -hmm. and, and culturally, we, we baby, <laughs> especially the boys, yeah. but then with my brother who had an intellectual disability, we really babied him, and I should have known, I know better, because I'm in special education, okay. but even yeah. in my 30s, I was babying him, so, you know, if, was that if I, considered? If I could respond from the research side, and then Kathleen, yes. you can speak as a parent because I, I just don't know everything. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> not even close. <laughs> but I tell you this, um, when we speak about emotional resilience, you remember I mentioned just really flew over at this idea that emotional resiliency comes from the skills that let you put the locus of control on the individual within a support system. The The road to cultural um, sensitivity, and Anne is going to really uh, go into this a lot more. Um, so, yes. And I know you're taking notes. Uh, please uh, tell me I'm right. Uh, but, um, or, or correct me if I'm not. Uh, but, but what it comes down to is, is uh, in some cultures, it's going to be very relevant that the locus of control is shared but you don't want it entirely on the support system where the, uh, the locus of control is beyond the individual. What we want to approach is having the individual as an adult within that culture uh, to transcend the status of being a disabled adult, but being an adult, share the locus of control within the support system, even if it's not centered exactly on them as we would expect in a Western European culture. Thank you, Rob. Kathleen, yes, thank any you. final uh, thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, just, just, to, just to answer her question, the study actually didn't go into those intersecting cultural factors. 
gotcha. um, but, but Rob raises really, really good points. And us as professionals, frankly, you know, um, we should take into account the, you know, the multicultural factors that might be present in any situation. The, the bottom line is the, the advice is still the same. We, we still need for these young people to, to at some point be taking the driver's seat, but we've got to find the culturally acceptable ways to make that possible. And what I have seen sometimes is that sometimes they're like little trailblazers. Sometimes they will eventually go to their own families and say, you have just got to let me do this my way. And mm -hmm. the families adjust regardless of the culture. And I've seen that many, many times, regardless of their country of origin mm -hmm. and how protective they naturally are going to be. Mm -hmm. That young person comes to the realization that they got to do it and the family has mm -hmm. to let them. And they'll say it. Uh, Alaya, within the research, you're going to look for the words collective versus individualist when you're looking at culture and its impact on how groups relate to each other. Uh, the more collective uh, a culture or society, the more they're going to want to share the locus of control. Gotcha. Okay. Kathleen, Rob, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Um, hope you can hang out with us for Anne's talk. This is going to be really cool. Thank you guys. Hey. Thank, thank you. you thank so you much. to everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you all. Alaya, I will introduce Anne, and then if you want to read her yep. bio, that would be great. Absolutely. And Anne, are you on mic? We'll, we'll get her on. Yes. Um, are you hearing me okay? Great. Is your computer are you all charged up? <laughs> yes, I'll be turning on the video soon and activating my screen share. Um, in all the right. meantime, I'll be, yes. Great. So just hang tight for one second. I was going to say, um, on be, uh, just so as we transition, I want to let people know that um, we will cover this again tomorrow, but APHCareerConnect.org is a lot of where this stuff will be stored, and we really want that to be a robust website for you to go to where myself and Joe and Elia and the staff are really bringing it up and modernizing it with blogs and interviews and, and, and excerpts from this conference. So please go to that site, give us feedback, and let us know what articles you want and what things you want covered, because we want this to be a resource for your teachers for your students, for your families, and for the community, and really make it diverse. Uh, so just a plug, aphcareerconnect.org. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Ann Kwong, who's going to talk to us this morning, um, bridging the cultural chasm, supporting the diversities as, as, widely, as rising professionals. I'm going to let you read that. Um, okay title again, Anne, and in just a second, Jaws is way too fast, but I've known Anne for about eight years now. She was a student graduating high school, and her and her peers came to both myself and Rob at the time, and they were working on Survivor Thrive, which was a really cool initiative for students in Southern California to really bring out the best of what students and families and culture and diversity have to offer, and really teach and instruct and, and, and influence the community on how blind kids from all walks of life can really do what they say they can do and give them that that bandwidth and that support and uh, I'm really really pleased to know Anne and Anne's come a long way she's currently the transition specialist at the Lighthouse of the Blind in San Francisco I believe you're going on your fourth year Anne is that correct yes um, almost four years <laughs> and she's done some brilliant things which I, I'm sure she'll tell you about and doing work experience and doing a lot of really cool initiatives and, and really bringing her expertise. Uh, Alaya, you want to go ahead and read the bio? Sure, sure. I will do that. Okay, so I'm um, so glad to have Anne and um, I will uh, just kind of give you a little bit of her background. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Anne passionately creates and implements and evaluates innovative strategies around education and employment readiness of blind youth in her roles as a transition program specialist at the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired in San Francisco. And she is a PhD student in education at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So congratulations on that, Anne. Um, it's not easy, I know, to be a PhD student at work. <laughs> um, I've been there, so I'm glad you're doing that. Um, and her role at the Lighthouse, and designs, manages, and implements innovative curricula and programs to support the transition of blind and low vision youth as they pursue post-secondary education or navigate the pathway to meaningful employment via the framework of empowering expectations, resume building through interactive work-based experiences, and effective mentoring. 
Prior to the Lighthouse, she worked as an education technician intern in the Washington, D.C. area, disaggregating student suicide, suicidality data. Um, sorry, I, the, just a lot of uh, vowels and consonants <laughs> stuck together there. Uh, data and analyzing its negative impact on both student and school excellence. Anne also participated in a project with the Institute for Educational Leadership on implications of cultural reciprocity with the implementation of the nationally recognized Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and pre-employment transition services. So through her research and advocacy, Anne hopes to continue empowering youth and families to envision, define, and achieve their future aspirations together. And she can be reached at um, on her LinkedIn page, and I will copy and paste that into the chat. Um, and her presentation today is called Bridging the Cultural Chasm, Supporting Diverse Youth as Rising Professionals with Inclusive Practices. So I'm super excited to hear about this, Anne. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. So I'll and, let you uh, take it away. Oh, go ahead. You've got about 35 minutes and about 20 after the hour, I'll give you a five minute warning so that at 25 after we can wrap it up before we get it shut down at 30, 30 after the hour. So just giving you that heads up. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I am trying to get my computer to screen share. So if you give me one moment and then um, as I can't seem to navigate JAWS and the screen share function at the same time, but if you all could bear with me for one second. Great. Well, hopefully Jaws will not interrupt us as we go on our way. So first of all, thank you so much, um, the APH Connect Center staff, um, including Aliyah, uh, Richard, for giving me the opportunity to engage in conversation with everyone. I'm not sure if I can top Kathleen Robb's uh, act. They're hard to follow. So um, Richard, I'm going to have to have a chat with you why you made me go second. But um, they provided such wonderful information, and it's a great set. Way, I think for me to go into what I have to share. Um, similar to what Rob and Kathleen kind of discussed, I want to make this as engaging and participatory as possible today. So there might be certain parts of the presentation where I'm like, what do you all think? Maybe that's just the, the teacher and the direct service provider in me <laughs> to ask questions. So as Richard shared uh, my fancy title for the presentation is really Bridging the Cultural Chasm, Supporting Diverse Youth as Rising Professionals with Inclusive Practices. And I think this talk is very timely with our current climate of distance learning, with a lot of um, additional racial and intersectionality, uh, current events that have been going on where a lot of inequities are further magnified and exacerbated. For instance, right, internet connectivity, where you live greatly affects whether you have the internet connectivity to go online and access distance learning. Language, how do we serve our ELL, English language learning and blind low vision youth? So I think that this is a very unfortunate, but also a very timely, um, discussion to talk about what are some effective strategies and what can we do in first understanding and then moving to creating strategies to supporting our low vision and blind youth populations who come from various communities and have different backgrounds. So um, as kind of Richard already said in my introduction, I'm based in the Lighthouse in San Francisco, which I'll just give a brief synopsis of our mission, uh, which is to ensure the success, satisfaction of individuals living with blindness and low vision through education, training, advocacy, and community building. Oh, 
Give me a second. The slide is not cooperating. Ah, there we go. Second slide. I want to ground our conversation and discussion in vignettes and student stories. So I want you to meet two of my students, Richard and Michael. Um, many of you probably know these are actually pseudonyms and not their real names for confidentiality purposes. But I want to also give a little bit of background of who Richard and Michael are. And throughout the rest of my presentation, you might find that their story will be interwoven throughout a lot of the kind of more theoretical frameworks that I'll be using to reference culture, because I strongly believe, and that's one of the strong reasons why I'm working as well as doing a grad program, that a lot of research is great, a lot of um, think theories are fantastic, but how do we make it applicable to the real world, right? Um, so I'll be interviewing some of these student stories inside some of the theoretical concepts to make them more relevant and applicable and usable for practitioners. So first, meet Richard. So Richard is someone when I met him at the time is a low vision uh, student who, I, who is partial. Um, the, he has RP. And because of his low vision status, he feels kind of stuck. He doesn't really use a cane and can see and get by pass with minimal uh, accommodations throughout school. But because of the fact that he wears glasses and has difficulty seeing at night, Richard has experienced lots of bullying um, and also experiences some mental health challenges. Richard was 16 at the time I met him. He comes from a very supportive Latinx family, so both parents speak Spanish. The father works in the field of construction. Both parents have never been to college, um, and they immigrated to the United States. Um, the one thing that Richard is very proud of, and I've noticed that as a strength about him when I first met him, is that the family really emphasizes hard work ethic. He's been trained slash taught slash conditioned to have very polite, very respectful. I often joke and say that Richard is the only one in my entire program who addresses the, me my, by Ms. Anne. Everybody else just calls me Anne. So the second student I wanted to introduce y'all to is Michael. So Michael was born totally blind at the time when we met. He was 17 years old. His family immigrated to the United States from Japan. Um, he loves Braille assistive tech. I think he breeds assistive tech. Um, and he's very proud of the relationship he has with his mother and really looks up to her and sees her as an excellent cook. And in the family, he shared that many of the housework is done by his mother. So at the time, he's never really been into the kitchen, touched any appliances, um, nor traveled independently before. Now. I want to say, why am I specifically selecting these two students to introduce you to? Why is cultural diversity and competence important? Well, um, I want to share a little brief statistic here. According to the U.S. Census Bureau report that came out in 2016, 44% of Californians speak a language that is not English at home. So um, this phenomenon obviously is, is maybe more noticeable in certain urban areas or in California, but it's moving across the entire country. Some of you may also experience and work with students and families whose primary language is not English that they use at home. So at Lighthouse, we, particularly with our transition program, um, we really try, and there are certain ways I think we can continue to improve, but we definitely try to create programming that is welcoming and really infuses best practices that incorporates recognition of the values that family bring in. So for instance, we actually serve um, out of the 305 youth under the age of 24 that we serve annually, about 13% identify as Asian Pacific Islander and 25% uh, from Latinx communities. 
So I want to share a little quote here that Richard um, shared with me in particular um, before we move on to more theory. And you'll notice some of these words resonate and come back as we continue to progress through the PowerPoint. So Richard shared before he started joining the Lighthouse Immersion programs, he shared, I hope to really gain a better understanding of the world of the blind, as I am still sighted, um, as I explained, he identifies as low vision. So I know not that much about how I should perceive things in certain ways, how to do certain things only a blind person can do, and how to act um, as a blind person should. You can see there are some inherent kind of preconceived notions that maybe Richard or society um, has infused in him um, about blindness. Um, I'm very limited in the knowledge of the world of the blind and wish to gain uh, more skills so I can tackle the adult world, a blind, confident, and outgoing individual. Work experience is also very key to me. I have never had a job before that's pay. Um, so that would be something completely new as well. I really respect and look up to my father, father and mother. And someday I hope to be able to go out, support my family, find a job, just like how my dad did when he immigrated here, being strong for the family. So now that I've introduced you to our key players, so to speak, uh, Richard and Michael. Um, I will briefly go over some of the learning objectives or outcomes comes. I hope that we'll be able to achieve in the time we have today. First is to really take a deep dive into cultural competency and awareness, as well as explore the implications of how concepts such as independence and disability may be viewed differently across cultures. And that speaks to um, a question that we had earlier. I also hope to engage in conversation with you all on what best practices you all have developed to support transition age youth and their families to develop that self-motivation and that resiliency that Rob and Kathleen spoke about around transition planning and employment readiness, all while respecting and taking into consideration the family's cultural values, right? Everyone has a, a moral compass like Rob mentioned and students and families from different cultural backgrounds have that as well. Third is to share family-oriented communication strategies. Different cultures have different communication styles, um, and it's good for us to, I think for me particularly when I started working, to learn about how silence, which we take here in the United States um, often as, oh, you understand, that's great. Well, that's not always the case for a lot of families, particularly in IEP meetings. And for, for my family, I immigrated from Hong Kong. My parents don't speak English. So when we sat in IEP meetings and my family just kind of silently sat there and nod, sometimes I'd be like, oh, great, you don't have any questions. You're all satisfied, great, move on. But that's not always the case. And finally, um, I hope that we can exchange resources around supporting students holistically um, throughout the entire transition process, supporting all the various identities they hold. So yes, they are blind, they are low vision, um, but also they have other identities. Um, they can be a woman, they can be a man, they can be gender nonconforming, and they can also uh, have come from immigrant communities. And not until we can support the whole person, I feel, can we really address truly transition planning? Because not only the blind part of me goes to work or the woman part of me goes to work or school or independent living, the entire person of me goes to work, right? All right, next, here's some theory. Hopefully everybody's gotten their favorite tea or caffeinated beverage for this, but um, I want to kind of get everyone on the same page um, when I use the word cultural chasm and I'll be referring to CLD, culturally linguistically diverse. I want to make sure that we all on the same page and speaking the same language, so to speak, and same understanding before I move onward. So for um, audio description here in my slide, I actually have an image of a circle which encloses a triangle. Um, and this is very helpful to provide um, visuals and a reference point of reference for a framework that I'll be referring to that I think is really helpful when trying to ground your work and research in 
being culturally sensitive. And this is the activity triangle theory, um, the cultural historical activity theory to be uh, to be specific, um, originally proposed by Vygotsky. Um, so you might be wondering, how is this representative of culture? Well, if you think about triangle, there are three points. Um, and if you have one of the kind of uh, lengths or legs of the triangle lying horizontally across, you have one vertex on the left. In the middle, it will be the highest vertex on top, and on the right, the third vertex. And then this triangle is enclosed um, or is surrounded by a circle. So the most left vertex, you can think of it as the actor. So the student, right? Um, and all of their identities and intersectionalities that they bring. The highest point in the middle would be the tools, right? Um, the norms, habits, cultural resiliency, and cultural capital and education that students will need to get in order to be successful and reach the third vertex on the right, which would be the outcome. And the circle represents the environment. We all exist within a broader ecosystem uh, of an environment. And for students and youth who exist between multiple circles, as when they're in school, they may be expected to behave and conform to a certain cultural norm. But when they're at home, they might be speaking a different language and be expected to conform to a different norm. Um, students that are blind and low vision who also have intersecting identities are having to be cultural brokers and bridges of multiple circles. So I want everybody to kind of keep that in mind as we continue with our conversation. So the whole point of the theory is the environment, culturally, really matters and really frames how and what access of tools students will have. And most people are probably familiar with intersectionality, which I've kind of referred to this term already, which is the interplay of oppressions or privileges as a result of membership, of belonging to different groupings. So in this case, these groupings can be race, gender, class, sexuality, disability, nationality, re religion, so on, right? This is not an all-encompassing term. So many of the culturally and linguistically diverse youth and families that we serve belong and is a part of that fabric of intersectionality. Um, and as I said, why am, am I referring to this as a chasm? So most of us in the transition space are probably familiar with the dreaded transition service delivery cliff. Once a student exits formalized K through 12 system, what next? And that was one of the big reasons that propelled WIOA that um, uh, Will, uh, Bill, sorry, talked about earlier in the conversation when he laid the groundwork for WIOA, is that because there isn't a lot of collaboration prior, um, Congress decided to create this legislation in hopes of providing a bridge. So there is not that big clip that exists. Well, imagine on top of that cliff, students and families are having to also navigate this cultural chasm where not only is certain terms like mentorship, maybe that term doesn't even exist in other cultures, right, conceptually. Um, but that the, la the um, access to the information, that the pamphlets for independent living is often only in English. So families who are really important to their youth and their young adult, particularly if the youth has not reached 18 yet, families so involvement and critical um, in that process, but yet they don't get the information. We tell our students, I tell my students, Richard and Michael, about what independence would mean, and I ask them what they think, but Richard's family, do they have access to that information? So as Richard is transitioning, so is the family. And th that's, those are some of the questions um, that I pose to you all to think about as you continue to work with your students. So some of these things that I mentioned, like translating certain things, providing interpreters, um, and providing or setting the same expectations and being on the same page of family about what independence means and what they see as success, those are all tools. Right, um, and you may remember that vertex of that triangle. Those are all tools that we can provide and empower students and their families with so that they can 
um, be on the same page and have and set high expectations for their student um, as we do in this transition space. I also want to keep in mind that um, in our conversation, oftentimes cultural references in the education space are brought in in a very deficit model. They need to learn English. Oh, they, they've not gone to college or, you know, in Michael's case, he's not learning independent because the mom is doing the majority of the housework. Well, I want to challenge everybody to also think from the family and community space, what are strengths and values that they bring in? Because let's face it, no one wants to hear if I was a young person, if I was Richard, I don't want to hear, oh, you, you need to learn better English, your family didn't go to college, so you need to do all these things. Plus, um, you know, you, you're not aware of disability, blah, 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 right? So you, we want to meet students where they're at. Um, and have that true dialogue and build that rapport and trust um, and, and leverage some of the strengths that the family brings in as well. In addition, that key conversation of how do they define independent living or independence? Um, similar to Rob said, some collectivistic cultures, living with the family is really important, even after 18. That's the case, that's the um, way in my case. Um, in the Chinese culture, you're expected to come back, to contribute, take care of your family once you've become an adult and, you know, left the nest in, in, in the um, United States definition of independence. What does disability and blindness mean? Right. In uh, California and in the space that I work with, we often have lots of arguments about blind positive language and how uh, discussions and heated debates about person verse versus identity first language. But let's step back and say, how, how is blindness referred in other cultures? Because that can be very telling. Um, if the only words to refer to blindness and low vision are words like impairment or um, medical model type of terms, then maybe that's the conditioning. So we have to have that conversation first with the student and the family about how they see blindness. Meet them where they're at. I like to kind of look at my role when I'm working with students and families like Richard and Michael as the guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. And I borrowed this from a TED talk I heard um, because I don't know everything. I don't know exactly what their situation is at home. And sometimes they're better at able to share with me their family values so I can have that uh, conversation with their family members and to really be on the same page about independence. So I give a little bit of a personal example here about blindness and how that's viewed in the API culture. So as I said, I immigrated from Hong Kong and my family and I, um, my first language, my mother tongue, so to speak, is Cantonese. And in the API culture, there is lots of conversation around saving face, that concept, and shame. So disability is really seen and blindness as shame because you belong to the family unit and the inherent assumption is if you're blind and disabled, you may not be able to contribute. So understanding that and being able to say, hey, you know, yes, I am blind, but that's part of who I am. And if I attend these independent living skills or get orientation and mobility training, it will equip me so that I can be a valued and contributing member of the society um, and return back to my family. Just like what Richard shared in his um, introduction that he wants to someday be able to give back to his family because he really looks up to his father as the role model of his home. And I think that that's why it's so important to have those transparent conversations and build that rapport. We can certainly increase social capital um, by obviously mentorship, right? Um, once we've established what mentorship means in various cultures, and maybe mentorship can be in the form of religious leaders if that's something that the family values. In addition, work experiences, right? Learning about what it means to go to work in different cultural norms that exhibit that takes place at the workplace and at home. What does it mean to be on time? My mantra with my students at the Lighthouse is early is on time, on time is late, and late is fired. And because they get paid through my work experiences, if you're late, your pay gets docked. Um, so there's that running joke of Anne is just going around docking people's pay. Um, so 
that accountability is very important and making sure that we're all on the same page of, with, with that. Next, I want to briefly share a little bit about the structure of the youth employment services that I coordinate and how Richard and Michael then joined us in one of our academies. So our youth employment services um, takes place now virtually and in person, um, but before it was primarily an in-person program. The Lighthouse, we are very fortunate to have a state-of-the-art residential area where you could think of it as a very nice college dorm, uh, where students get to spend time away from their family, and in our summer program, they spend four weeks away from their family. Um, and throughout those four weeks, they get to build community and we kind of become their temporary family and as a result have a lot of influence over the environment, that circle, as well as have a lot of opportunity to build those meaningful connections and understand culturally where students are coming from. All of the staff that work for us are blind and low vision in the specific transition program, including myself. And in the summer, we hire college students and pay them to be staff role models and mentors for our youth. And we intentionally also select mentors with diverse backgrounds, um, that key intersectionality, because sometimes it's really important for students and families to see themselves reflected um, in that conversation as service providers as well, right? Um, you want to have service providers who are both blind, low vision, uh, as well as sighted allies, but that's the same for ethnicity, language, gender identification, and so forth. And through working in the YES process, I kind of developed my own little three-step model um, and strategy that I use when working with families from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds. So I like to first look at authentically appreciating where they're coming from. So that's the A part. Then creatively collaborating. What are the tools we need, right, to collaborate? And lastly, encourage and empower. Um, because at the end of the day, um, they'll leave my program and hopefully they will have the skills and confidence as well as cult have developed cultural capital to navigate other systems. So that's my ACE strategy that I use um, in many of my programs. In the four weeks that Richard and Michael were with us, the first week they got to build their skills and confidence. So that's a lot of the soft skills that Rob mentioned. So creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Those four C's we work on. They also get a lot of assistive technology orientation and mobility. Um, so one of the challenges working with Richard was cane use because he kind of looked at it as I'm currently, my vision hasn't gotten that worse yet. And before when I've used the cane, I was bullied. So I don't want to use one, period. And because of his cultural upbringing, sometimes there's that tension of, I need to be the provider of my family someday. But if I use a cane, would that make me less than? Right? Um, and that was very... I really appreciated him for being so honest and sharing that because that really helped us have conversations around cane use and further support his learning. With Michael, learning independent living skills around cleaning and cooking was definitely a struggle at first. And also traveling because um, he had very supportive family members, particularly his mom, um, was very supportive, drove him to many of his, you know, debate and other activities and would cook and, you know, um, take care of the family really well. So for him, he was like, do I really need to learn these things? <laughs> In the second week, we really focused on building your network and community and branding. So really giving them more tools, that top vertex of the triangle, and establishing and creating more cultural and social capital. We took students to various blindness conferences, including the National Federation of the Blind, where some of our students, because of their socioeconomic status, had never been on an airplane before. They could not imagine how blind people could go to the airport. How do you look for a suitcase? Um, so that was really fun experience for them. And finally, for our 
third and fourth week, we work on that building your resume and future, that work experience practicum. So really bridging the knowledge that we've learned and synthesizing what we've learned in the first two weeks and having the students go to work. We partner with various employers in the Bay Area. We have um, around, uh, how, around a dozen or so 15 partners that we, we work with from gyms to nonprofits to legal entities um, to theaters. So we try our best to also match student interest um, with the career because I know that particularly one of our students said, I really want to be a lawyer, very set on being a lawyer. Then they spent about a week and a half in the law environment and said, learning about how to file legal briefs is the most dry thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, so really getting that exposure of what it really means. Students uh, get to purchase professional attire, um, and then we mentioned travel. So for their work, they actually have to dress for the part. We teach them how to go to work independently, and then we just let them use the public transportation system that we have in the Bay Area, and they have to pack their own meals and things like that to navigate to their host employers. And that part that's at the end, the work experience, really is truly, I think, most impactful in terms of building cultural um, awareness, as well as creating and building that confidence, right? Um, and students get very excited to hear about how much money do I get? Because a lot for a lot of them, it's their first paycheck as well. And all of the learning outcomes are in alignment with the WIOA parameters, particularly the five required activities. All right, so my next kind of part I wanted to briefly touch upon as I see that I'm running out of time um, is that awareness of different communication styles, right? Collectivistic versus um, individualistic. And in this case, communication styles referring to low versus high context communication styles. So what does silence mean? So low context communication styles um, really emphasizes exactly what is being said dur during the interaction. So the communication is straightforward, specific, logical, direct. Um, not to make generalizations, but that tends to happen a lot more in the United States and other European, you know, Western, westernized countries. And I tend to also notice this a lot more with male identified folks. The second is high context communication styles. So that's heavily dependent on the subtle messages of the interaction. So body language is very important. Facial expressions is very important. Timing of silence, which um, I definitely experience, um, is very important in this context. So verbal messages may not necessarily truly reflect and convey the genuine intention and meaning of the speaker. Um, so a lot of times during various meetings, we may be talking with a lot of jargon like IEPs and such forth. And you turn to the family member or student say, do you understand? Um, and then I'd be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, nod and, and say yes or silence. And I've noticed that a lot with particularly while working with Richard. Um, he was very quiet, very polite, very respectful, as I said, but very quiet. Um, but after spending more time building that rapport and trust that is so important for any work, like any advice I give or information I try to share will not be taken to heart if there's no trust, right? So after we've established that trust, Richard was very candid about sharing what was bothering him, what he didn't understand, and sometimes just asking things like, how, how can I bridge that conversation with my family about work? And, and for them to see that blindness and some of the stresses I feel from um, being bullied, that those are real uh, concerns I have, right, with, with his family members. All right. So I want to... Um, encourage you all to think and feel free to type in your chat box your thoughts what does independence mean to you personally right um, and to think back from what i've shared so far would that align with what your students and families that you work with you know would that be their same definition of independence
So next, I want to talk about various things to consider um, when thinking about collaboration with multiple stakeholders, including students and families from various backgrounds. So um, creating that space for that collaboration is really important um, and having that welcoming environment uh, that I've learned. So for instance, because I know silence is uh, something that is hard, um, particularly for families, if they don't want to be judged or they, they're frustrated or sometimes family members who are also not native English speakers may feel judged um, because they have an accent so, or they don't want to sound ignorant. Um, I know that that was something that Richard's family experiences. So providing a translator can help minimize some of those power dynamics that are unequal. Um, also really encouraging them to express or in other ways, maybe verbally or also talk about it beforehand with their student and really empower that student to take ownership of those conversations as well before arriving at meetings to have that honest dialogue. Five minutes in. Thank you. Um, so for instance, one example that uh, was shared with me is that in certain instances, Latinx in the Latinx culture, um, and that's a very broad category as well. Sometimes the women, the moms are less likely to ask the question because the father male figure may be the ones typically making the decisions or asking the questions or interacting with the bureaucratic agencies right so keeping that in mind when creating a space sometimes translators and interpreters may also not have disability and blindness training um, recently i actually had um, a workshop where I had a student that did not speak English participate. And um, because I spoke the language the student speaks, I was able to, um, or, or part of the language, I was able to understand that I specifically mentioned, oh, this is very important to have transferable skills. Advocacy can work in the workspace, college, um, and for blindness and accommodations. And the interpreter intentionally left out all of the sentences that had to do with blindness. And I'm like, this is a workshop for blindness and empowerment. You need to translate those sentences. So making sure you've had those conversations with the interpreter as well to make the space welcoming and meaningful. Um, next, I'll briefly touch upon this uh, motivation because I think Rob and Kathleen did a great job discussing resilience already and how that's really important. Um, and in terms of youth that are mul from multiple cultures and are also blind and low vision, it's even more critical because oftentimes, at least for me when I was growing up, you didn't know where you belonged. Not only do you have to navigate the blindness world and the sighted world, right, but now I have to navigate the English speaking, you know, world in the education system and my world and environment at home. So how to build the resilience, the problem solving skills, the communication skills, all those soft skills. In addition, one thing I want to highlight before I move on is the concept of help seeking. So we've often he heard of blind people um, may have learned helplessness from people doing everything for them. Um, from my interaction, particularly with working with Richard, he had the paradoxical kind of um, issue where he did not want to seek help because he was bullied uh, as well as he was raised to be self-sufficient and, and that was a value the family had even he, though he couldn't see certain things at night he was not willing to ask for help so how do we really have those conversations with him about that so um, I'm not going to as I'm sensitive that there is not too much time left but I have two quotes from both Richard and Michael about the end of the Forex experience with us. What did they learn culturally? Um, what did they learn about blindness, confident building and empowerment that they really took away with them at home, uh, to home, to their home environments, whether that be uh, staff respecting them and 
having that authentic appreciation of their culture, whether that be staff working collaboratively and creatively with them and their families, as well as encouraging them to seek more skills. And as I know that I only have like one minute left, I really want to end with this quick, I'm sorry, Richard. Um, is it okay if I show a two minute video? <laughs> Go ahead, you're good, you're good. All right, so um, I got permission from this student to actually show um, this video. So you might hear the student's actual name in the video. Um, and I think it really truly embodies that confidence building through experiential learning and mutual respect that we've all been talking about. All right. Uh, can you all hear me pretty well? Yes. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm sure you're, it's a better, bittersweet moment for you all. You know, your children are coming home tomorrow, and they'll get to tell you, they get to tell you all about how much they've learned while they're here. So let me just talk about how those three elements that Ethan just described to you impact me as a uh, student here at the YES program. So the first week was a boot camp style week. Uh, and the uh, leader here had us on our toes from 7.30 a.m. till 10 p.m. And it was really, you know, trying on us, but we went through it. But during the boot camp aspect, we had a lot of training in orientation, mobility, technology, and living skills. Uh, so for, uh, for me, I'd like to focus a bit more on the or orientation mobility component. Uh, two days in, we found out what our specific work locations were gonna be. And my orientation mobility teacher that was assigned, Gina, really hammered into me the route that I was going to take to uh, my work, which was in Oakland at a law firm called Disabilities Rights California. Now, after the first week of boot camp, which was intense, we had a second week. So we had some work. And now I'm just going to talk about the work for the second week and the uh, fourth week. This was really an empowering experience for me. I really, uh, really did appreciate all that my supervisor at work did for me. Um, I really do appreciate all that the Lighthouse staff did. It was really empowering for me to be able to tell folks that I was independently able to go to work without somebody watching me constantly. It was something new, but something that had to be done eventually. It was also really empowering for me to be able to um, go on my own to something like Starbucks after work if I wanted to get coffee or to go to CVS because I'd never in my years of education been able to uh, do those things. I mean, I, I've gone places, but my own orientation mobility specialist has always uh, shadowed me, so it's not exactly the same experience. Having that accountability to go on your own and to also figure it out when you're lost really does help in that growing process. The third week of the academy, we ventured off to Las Vegas. Uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? So <clears throat> we did go to the National Federation of the Blind Convention, as Ethan alluded to. Um, it was a really empowering experience. And for my career, I want to be an attorney someday. There are so many networking opportunities, whether that be in the exhibit hall, whether that be during breakout sessions of meetings with professionals, or just in the hallways. You know, the, for me, the networking was especially uh, empowering. So I really do feel like the Yes Summer Academy is four intense weeks of um, fun-filled but educational experiences has really set me up for an excellent future and hopefully will lead each and every person here to success. Thank you. So that was a little speech from one of our students at the commencement of the program and it really hammered home the idea of accountability and setting high expectations. Um, if you meet students and families where they're at, addressing all of their whole person and all the intersectionalities, we're able to arrive at that same high expectation that we want to set. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm sorry I had to rush through the end a little bit, but feel free to contact me at the Lighthouse or me in general if anyone has any questions now or later. Thank you. And we do have so one quick question, and if okay. we could spend maybe 60 seconds on that question, and then we can round things up with our closing code. Would that be okay? Yes. Rob had a question to, yeah. to hey, share. Hey, uh, and um, I just wanted to see if your experience tracked with ours in um, experience a new culture, getting no new family. Um, often uh, when we're lucky and the family's able to communicate their needs, we'll see barriers when we talk about things like independent living and they'll be like, no, 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 they're never gonna live independently and that's not a disability thing, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And we get that and we go, okay. 
Uh, do you find that sometimes when having an open discussion about culture and cultural norms that they can actually give you the pathway or, or tip you off to the words to use to end up getting those employment norms to align with cultural norms like what can we do to get them to contribute to the household it becomes very motivating for some people compared to how do we get your kid to move out, which is maybe not so motivating. And Annie, can you answer that in 20 seconds? <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Um, so I think definitely you've kind of answered your own question in that uh, questioning process, Rob. It is really looking at what do they value, right? If independent living is not the primary focus, then perhaps looking at how to contribute back to the household, community, um, church, other types of things that they really genuinely appreciate and are ingrained into and has been brought up with in terms of their norms and habits and expectations and using those um, rather than just continue to emphasize independent living if independent living the way we define it traditionally in the United States education system is not what they're um, interested in doing at the time. Well, this was amazing. Great information. Some of my takeaways, uh, I always like to, to be active listener. I, I really heard a lot about competence, trust, tools, expectations, empower, strengths, values, and at meeting students where they, where they are at, those were all different things that I heard echoed throughout. If you are waiting for the closing code for today's session, today's closing code is education. And it's also in the chat box for you. I'm sorry, everyone, that we had to speed along towards the end, but I think that it also shows how much good information there was that was shared, and we just wanted to take every single opportunity to get it in. So I wanna say thank you to all of our presenters for helping to give us good things to think about and thank you to everybody in the audience who chose our session on transition. And um, we're certainly here. If there's anything else you wanna throw into the chat box while we're on, you know, you can go ahead and exit your room and uh, we'll be here for another couple of minutes. Thank you, Amy. Oh, sorry, I, I was on mute. I was just saying thank you to the presenters for, for doing this for, uh, for Career Connect. Um, this is really important information and uh, I'm sure Richard or myself will be reaching out to you again <laughs> to, uh, to you know, maybe help us with some webinars on Career Connect or just some roundtable chat discussions. Um, there, there are all kinds of neat things that uh, Richard has planned for Career Connect. So I'm really, really excited about, about moving forward and, and continuing yes. our collaboration. This is great. That's part of our vision. And we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow as well on the, the next session. Yeah. I'm excited to be a part of. Definitely. Oh, 17 messages. I'm looking down. <laughs> and I'm I just keeping, give you keeping up with some of the questions. Will we get those questions forwarded to us, Amy? Will there be some kind of a, a, a extraction of those? So that's a good question. What I can share is a lot of the questions that I'm that I'm attending to has to do with housekeeping. Okay. So um, the, the questions that were pertinent to all of the conversation was, uh, I believe, unless I missed something, everything was addressed. But certainly, we do have access to the chat. And um, oh, Got thank it. you to our closed captioning. They just logged off. Yes. Uh, so anyway, yes, we have that and we can extract that. And as long as the people who uh, were attendees put in the chat box to uh, clicked on all panelists and attendees, that shows up in the chat. Anything that's done privately among the panelists or privately one-on-one -on -one does not show up on chat. Got it, that's fair. This there was, was a great. question about where to find the recording. Yeah, the, you know what, the recording I know will be, you know, processed over time and we'll have it, but I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look mm. like of where it'll be housed. You can go to APH.org or email the Connect Center in the next couple of days and we might have a better answer for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Timeline answer. What is it? Connect Center? What's the address, the email address, Eli? Uh, it's the uh, 
at, hold on, I gotta find that. I don't wanna, I don't wanna give the wrong, <laughs> the wrong um, email Connect address. Connect Center or, yeah, something, yeah, at APH. Let me see. Yes, it's connectcenter at APH.org, that's correct. Got it. And I think a lot of the sessions will be recorded so that it, we're in the yes. same as everybody else. And I want to give you mad cool points for quoting Vygotsky. Is there anything that guy doesn't know? Love Vygotsky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm very excited about theory. I'm trying to cut that back as I realize not everybody shares that same passion. But I was like, I need to put some theory in there. <laughs> no, mad awesome. Cool points. Go on, yeah. Okay, well, it looks like things are quiet, so I'm going to go ahead and close up the room. Enjoy your break for lunch, and perhaps we'll continue to see each other pop in and out of other rooms. But thank Absolutely. you very much yes. for everything yes. you, you gave today. Thank, thank you. you all. I don't yes. see you later, Lola. I'll see you tomorrow if I don't run into you later. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you, bye bye. Yes, stay safe. Bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.